I'm very excited about this. We're talking today uh, kind of a case study. We're going to look at the extraordinary long time coming meteoric rise of a band from right here in New Orleans, Hooray for the Riff Raff, which has in the past year, year and a half, really just kind of exploded into the stratosphere. And uh, we've got Andy Beiser, their manager, their longtime manager, Kirby Lee from ATO Records, and Josh Brinkman, their booking agent from Monterey International. And we're going to talk about Hooray for the Riff Raff and how these folks came into the picture and what the team is doing to help this band take advantage of the great opportunities that are coming their way. But first, let's have a look at the band and uh, understand exactly why these guys are so important for us. Hooray for the Riff Raff! <laughs> Well, I know it's wrong, but I can't help but want you all back to myself. Love is a game we foolishly play. I guess it's always been that way. Well, I know it's wrong, but that's all right. The sun is laughing in my face, shining its light. You could be mine on beer summertime. I'll feed you watermelon off the vine. Well, I know it's wrong, but that's all right. Well, I take you. And I tell you one thing that always makes some sense. It's never wrong to have a fence. All right. Hooray for the Ref Ref on Conan just this week. That was what, Tuesday? Tuesday, Tuesday night. So uh, you were in LA on Tuesday? Kirby and I uh, flew out to LA. Fantastic. Well, so let's, I mean, we need to stipulate right off the top. L lead singer and the front woman of the band, kind of the nucleus of the band is Alinda Lee Sagara. So we need to stipulate right off the top of the back. Extraordinary voice, extraordinary singing voice, charisma for days. I mean, just unbelievable charisma. You could see it right on TV. So uh, tell us a little bit. I mean, some of us are already a little bit familiar with Olinda's story. It's gotten quite a little bit of, uh, quite a, a bunch of publicity. She's got quite a unique story. Andy, you want to tell us a little about where she came from? Uh, sure. The, the, the nutshell is um, she was raised um, by her uh, elderly Puerto Rican uh, aunt and uncle in the Bronx, um, ran away from home the day after she turned 17, traveled a lot, did some uh, hopping trains and hitchhiking, and ended up in New Orleans and uh, started playing the washboard, just like some of the uh, people that you see on Royal Street or you know around town, and then moved up to banjo, moved up to guitar, and that's the 30-second version of her backstory. But she started playing music, what, so about six, seven years ago, something like that? Uh, maybe eight or nine, yeah. But not somebody that was like a childhood prodigy and went to NOCA no, and did all that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But ran away from home at 17, riding the rails, hobo style. And it's so that is quite a sexy story. Yeah, it's an interesting story. Also, the angle of, you know, being one of, one of these um, musicians that plays on Royal Street during the day for tips and then plays on Frenchman Street at night with just these pickup, um, uh, you know, traditional jazz bands, um, and then deciding to, you know, form her own band and, and write her own songs instead of playing the old standards is also something that um, I found interesting when I first met her, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the press finds interesting as well. So, Alinda Lee Segarra runs away from home at 17, riding the rails, hobo style, but actually, 
Her real name is Rachel Rosenblatt, and she's from Correct. Yonkers, and she went to Vassar, that's right? right. That's, that's so, right. So it's all just a phony... That's not, that's phony. not right. That's not right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how did you first encounter her? I mean, how did, you, how did she first come across your radar? And, and you were already like a huge, big-time, powerful artist manager that was ruling the roost here in New Orleans that at that time. That is not true as well. Um, I, uh, well, I guess my, my, my quick backstory would be that I, uh, I went to Tulane and I worked in the, in the radio station at WT Well in the mid-90s when college radio, the, uh, the powers that be thought that you could spend money on that and find the next Green Day or Nirvana. And that was my first introduction to the music business. And then I stuck around New Orleans for a while, went to law school, uh, and I got my dream job. I was working in-house at EMI Music Publishing. And I was like literally working on the Beatles and the Stones. And uh, I decided I wanted to leave New, uh, leave New York and move back to New Orleans. And uh, I said, I'd rather live in New Orleans and just be a lawyer than live in New York and have my, my favorite lawyer job. So wow. anyway, well, that's so some I, dedication right there. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things involved, but thank you, sure. And, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I, would, you know, I go see bands play all the time. And, and um, I had read about Why Are We Building Such a Big Ship, which is a band uh, in New Orleans. I read about them in Anti-Gravity magazine and went to see them play. And Hooray for the Riff Raff was opening. And uh, this was 2007. And I was completely blown away by the songwriting. Um, you know, Scott had mentioned the charisma and the voice, and, and that was all there. Um, it's been clearly developed over seven years. But the one thing that she did have in 2007 that, that completely blew me away was these, these amazing melodies. I'm not, if you're familiar with the, with the first record, I mean, songs like the June Bug Waltz and Bricks and Here It Comes and Daniela. And I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, who, who are you? What, what is this? And because she was playing, you know, banjo and there were some of these old-timey instruments, I thought, well, maybe these are covers that I'm just not familiar with, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know. So I went up to her after the show and I was just like, wow, were those are your songs? Were those covers? And she was, yeah, I, yeah, I wrote all those songs. I said, well, I'd love to buy a CD. And she said, oh, I don't have any CDs. And I was, oh, that's too bad. She said, well, actually, I have this one CD in my purse and it was this burned CD that was just in her purse. And she's like, I'll sell it to you for 20 bucks. And I was just like, okay, sure, you know, like, I mean, we both knew what was going on. I didn't give a shit, you know, it was like these amazing songs. I didn't want to lose them. I didn't know who she was, if she was going to be, you know, going off somewhere else. She might be on Conan, you never know. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's how I, I was introduced to her. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. So, and, and that was when? Take, take us back. That was, that what, was in 2000, 2007, I think. 2007, and this is 2014. So it's yeah. taken seven years from there to now. That's right. So what happened? So what, what, I mean, so you, so you meet her. Right. You didn't immediately say, oh, and by the way, you know, I'd like to be your manager, or sure. did you? No, I mean, I, I, uh, I have a friend who hangs in, in the circles that she hangs in, um, and I said, hey, do you know this, this, this person, Alinda, and this band Hooray for the Riff Raff? And he, and he said, yeah, and I said, I'd like to have a meeting with her. So we, we met at the Saturn Bar, but it's actually kind of funny because we both went to Sugar Park before the meeting. And so we bumped into each other at Sugar Park, which was the old Sugar Park on, uh, on Dauphine, right by Vaughn's. And, um, and then we met up at the Saturn Bar, and I was just, you know, I told her who I was and how impressed I was with her songwriting and her band. And, and I, I just said to her, look, if, if um, you know, I don't know what you're interested in, if you just want to, like, travel and play music and, you know, you know, mess around or whatever, or if you want to try to have, like, an actual career in music, um, we could work together. And so... Um, there you go. And so she became, you, was, she yeah, became yeah. your client at that point. Correct. Yeah. So that's interesting because with her kind of story, running away from home at 17, mm -hmm. again, you know, the hobo riding the rails thing and then being in New Orleans as part of that sort of bohemian gutter punk kind of scene that we're, Why Are We Building Such a Big Ship came out of and, and, and some of those other bands, you would think that her ethos is more of that, uh, no, you know, screw the business, screw the man, I don't want any of that stuff, I, ju I just, you know, want to be left alone and, and write my songs on the street. And yet, if she's agreeing to work with you, that kind of suggests that she's thinking on a, on a bigger, bigger plane. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I love about Alinda is she's really, really driven, and she's, she's, um, she's really smart, and she, she gets it, you know? And um, 
she, yeah, she wanted to give it a whirl. And it wasn't like, um, it wasn't like I was signing to some, some really exclusive onerous deal or anything. You know what I mean? Like, so it's not like, um, I mean, you could keep that ethos and, and work with me. You know what I mean? It's not like, uh, you know, you're immediately signing a 360 deal with Interscope. You know, it's, there, right. there's many steps. Well, talk about some of the, I mean, there's a long period between that initial, okay, we'll do this, to getting some of the other team members involved. So just give us a couple of the highlights of some of the, the important milestones that you hit along the way that led to the ability to reach for a wider platform. I, I really think the most, the most important thing was just Alinda developing as a songwriter and a performer and a person. You know, and I think she'd be the first one to tell you that. Um, that, you know, the, if you listen to the first record that came out in 2008 and you listen to this new one, it's like two different bands. And I think that, you know, you just, I guess record companies used to do this thing called artist development, you know, and I guess we were, we were just doing that on our own time. Okay. And I mean, with, with milestones, and I, I mean, no, I don't really know. I'm, I mean, was there a first tour that was a huge disaster or anything like that? Um, we booked, she and I booked a two-month tour of the United States of America um, through using MySpace and um, just emailing people out of the blue. And that was pretty crazy when you look back on it. Because um, we, we had like maybe 3,000 likes or fans on MySpace, and we would just put up a post. Hey, we need shows on the West Coast. Who can help out? You know, and, and people would help out. Or... Um, you know, we would do some research, you know, what what bands are in Denver that would, like, seem to make sense to book a show for us? Because, you know, doing show swaps is really important, what we did. You know, we would, we would you know, people would want, always want to come to New Orleans to play. So if we said, hey, if you set up a show for us in Boston, we'll set up a show for you in, in New Orleans. So that and was helpful. So how long were you trying to get a, a label deal, booking agency representation? How How hard was that to make happen? It was really hard. Um, it, was, it was extremely hard. Um, for Lookout Mama, the record that came out in 2012, we thought it was really a watershed breakthrough album, and we thought surely um, someone domestically would want to put it out, and, and no one did. And no one that we reached out to said, yeah, I would like to put that record out. And, uh, and that was a, a big bummer. Uh, but we were like, all right, well, we'll do a Kickstarter, and we, ha we have plenty of fans, and we made a bunch of money, and we pressed it up on vinyl, and we sold out of the 1,000 records that we pressed up on vinyl in addition to the CDs, and it was, you know, it, you just got to do it yourself. I, I did forget one thing was um, uh, Loose Music is a, a, a label in England, and they, uh, they came in, and they put out an album in 2011, which was a compilation of the first two records. All right, fantastic. Well, so speaking of watershed moments, it uh, is pretty fairly acknowledged that the Newport Folk Festival in 2013 was a huge break for the band. National exposure on, on NPR and other things. So why don't we talk about how that show came together, because I think that's where also some of the other team members started to join the story. Sure. Um, the band was about to go to England, and we got an email from Jay Sweet, the director of the Newport Folk Festival, the guy who basically took it from sort of its faded glory back to something that's really special, and I think Josh can talk more about that. But um, he, he sent us an email and said, hey, do you want to play the Newport Folk Festival? And it was like, from out of the blue, it was like the most exciting thing. It was like, you know, hugs and high fives and, and, the, and the whole thing. I mean, it's just like the kind of thing you, you, you dream of. And um, so that was really exciting, and, and I think you know, Josh could talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, because we now, you've got, we been got trying to get email. a booking agency at, at that point, at the, right? Correct. You were correct. still We didn't have a booking, booking agent or a, a domestic record label. Yeah. Okay. Well, Josh, you want to pick up the story from there? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Josh Brinkman, um, the booking agent for, for the Riff Raff. Um, kind of how, <clears throat> how that all began to spiral is Jay Sweet, who, which Andy hit on, I, I, really have a high respect for and look at him as, as really kind of taking Newport and bringing it back around to and, and re reinvigorating it and bringing and refocusing on what everybody looks back on as the importance and significance of Newport within the American landscape or the American music landscape. Um, 
so I had had mul have multiple conversations with him on an annual basis. Uh, I've had a number of different acts play the festival, and I always find myself talking to him about artists that I've come across or that I've heard of that maybe at a point where it would be good for him to introduce into into the festival. Um, I think I went to Boston for in late or in September in late 2011 because I think it was 2012 was the first year that. We played it, or maybe it was 23rd, or it was last year. Um, and he had mentioned that he was putting an offer out to Hooray, and that he had been talking to Andy, which immediately to me was like, oh, this is great. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, this putting two things together. This is awesome. And at that point, I think I reached back out to Andy and was like, hey, I heard you guys have this Newport offer. After we'd been in dialogue on and off, maybe for 12 months before that, or a year and a half. Um, well, how did you guys get to know each other? How did you come in contact? I, uh, I had come across Ray for the Riff Raff on some, a couple of different blogs online. And the one thing that really hooked me was Alinda did this cover of this Dylan song that I was a huge fan of that I thought nobody else knew about, uh, Seven Curses, which was on the bootleg series. And that's kind of where I first, I first kind of was like, oh man, she's amazing. And so, and so did you reach so out? As a fanboy, just been like, they're so incredible. I got to reach out to this band. And so what do they have going on? You know, I think it was on WWOZ, I think, is what, where she did the cover. Yeah. So. And, so, awesome. and so you called Andy or like, hey, you know, do you guys an need email. an agent? I was like, hey, I just came across the band. And I noticed you guys don't. And, and at that point, I had a handful of clients, but I'd always really prided myself on, I was, as, as an agent, I wanted to always do my own thing. Um, and, and, and discover new bands, that's kind of why I got involved in music in the first place. Right. Um, the, thrill of, the thrill of that. And I just reached out to him and was like, I see you guys don't have an agent. What, what are you doing? You know, what's, what's your plan? Or is there anything I can do to help? And started from there. Yeah, he emailed me out of the blue. I uh, met him at South by Southwest. And um, then he wouldn't book us. <laughs> and, uh, and so I asked him. Why not? Yes. Why, why not? Why giant, you... giant initial... I love you, but let's wait, you know? And what was your, what was your hesitation? Was it that they well, just think, didn't have enough uh, presence know, uh, uh, in the marketplace, or what? I think when you look at an artist at, that, at the level that they were at at that time, it's, it's, it's not, and Andy can speak to that, because they booked their shows for so many years. It's no matter who you are or where you, what company you work for, it's, it's not an easy task to do. So. You know, I always wanted to, to tread a little lightly on it and not fall head over heels in love with something and let, you know, the, the music fan inside of me dominate what the business decisions are. But So is it, was it because they were, you know, playing coffee houses for tip jars and it just wasn't, you know, or, or had they gr graduated at that point to being a hard ticket band and actually getting decent guarantees? What... We haven't been a hard ticket band getting decent guarantees until like the last six months awesome. you know? <laughs> <All right. laughs> really I mean you know so what, but was that the, was that the hesitation was like there well, was no money to be made here that's a, it's a it's a tough question I think everything is about timing you know and, and at the end of the day I was at a point as an agent where I was like you know what Alinda is an, is is one of the most amazing songwriters I've heard in years um, you can just tell that certain things are in place, that she's an amazing, art, amazing artist, that Andy you know, bleeds and sweats for her and, and is willing to go to the wall for her. There's other things that come into play where at the end of the day I was like, you know what, like, yeah, let's give it, let's do it, let's just go and, and dedicate yourself fully into doing it. Now Andy, you were in conversation with a couple of different booking agencies at the time, still trying to reel in somebody to, to take this, this project on. How did you end up deciding to go with Monterey? Yeah, there was, there was another person involved, and, and to be fair to that person, he, he was sort of like, I'm not ready until I hear the record, which was the record that Conan O'Brien was holding. And um, he, he was like, well, I'm not ready to go until. So we were like, well, we really like Josh. Alinda, Alinda really liked Josh. The other guy um, might not have been the best fit personality-wise, because I, I mean, I talked to this guy on the phone at least twice a day, maybe more than that. On, on most days, and if, if we don't talk on the phone, it's like, oh, I didn't talk to Josh today. That's weird, yeah. you know. I miss so you. yeah, I miss you yeah. too, buddy. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it's it's good to work with people that you really like, like Kirby. Like I love Kirby, yeah, you right. Know? And 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 she's great to talk to, and 
And, um, you know, it's important that the people on your team are people that you really like because you have to talk to them all the time and deal with them and, and deal with problems, you know, and if it's someone you don't like and you're dealing with problems, it's going to it's gonna really be a problem. I think that's right? a real fundamental, at the end of the day, it's a real fundamental, like, point for this whole situation is that we're talking about an artist on a human level that you can connect with, that multiple people, anybody can connect with. I mean, Alinda writes music that is accessible for to all sorts of different types of people. And therefore, she sh surrounds herself with people who are really invested in her and, and believe in her. And that's, that's always, those are the signs. I mean, this isn't, she isn't like what you hinted towards earlier. She isn't something that was generated and created by what people look at as like an overall machine. This is real, you know? What you see is what you get with Alinda. And at the end of the day, that's like the most alluring thing possible. But you've made a couple of important points is that the people on the team actually have to actually be able to get along. Oh, yeah. Them. So no, no. if, you know, it's like great agent, but total asshole can't deal, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. <that's, laughs> so, right. And, and no. but also, I mean, it's and, like, but it's also like the a, passion, because you were saying right. how this other agent was like, yeah, yeah, but I need this, I need this. And Josh is like, come on, man, come on, man. Right. And that's the thing with Kirby as well is that, you know, I mean, Kirby is, is, I would say Kirby, no offense to Josh, but is like the number two super fan behind me. You know, like, I'm, I'm, in, I'm the band's number one super fan, and she's tied for first now, but you know what I mean? Like, because Kirby was, was so passionate, and you could tell, like, wow, this person is gonna, this person is gonna, is gonna be our, you know, our, our product manager, is gonna be the person that makes sure that this, this record gets the push that it deserves, and, um, well, she can talk to that. All right, so Kirby, you've been sitting yet, there so, so yeah. patiently this whole time. Sorry to wait until this this moment to bring you into the story, but tell us about first a little bit about ATO because not everybody is is familiar with the label, but those who are familiar know that it's an extraordinarily respected outfit. And then how you first became aware of Hooray for the Riff Raff and why you uh, got interested. Um, well, ATO is an independent record label. We're based in New York. Um, we have, let's see, Alabama Shakes, Old Crow Medicine Show, Walkerville River. Um, uh, but this year, a big priority for us was, is Hooray for the Riff Raff. And um, so, yeah, I saw, I guess the first time I saw Alinda play was about in 2012 at the Jalopy Theater in Red Hook, which is, um, a small, like, old-timey type of theater where everyone sits in pews. And her um, best friend, one of her best friends from growing up in high school, curates a Roots and Ruckus night every Wednesday. And I'd actually, I go there a lot. They have this Brooklyn home companion thing that I like. Um, so it just happened, a friend had told me, had seen her in San Francisco, and told me I should see her. And so... The first time I saw her, um, she played Daniela, which is one of the first songs she ever wrote, which I love. And she actually, we just got her to record it um, again for, for a Newport piece we're going to do, which is um, amazing. But then she played Small Town Heroes. Um, so soon after that show, she had a Mercury Lounge show, and I tried to invite everyone from the office to come see her. Um, and, it's just one of those things where, you know, we have so many, so much, we're so small, we just always are telling each other to go to shows, and no one came, so then I ended up telling them, just come to the office. So they came to the office, it was Alinda, Yossi, and Sam Doors, and they played, yeah, they played Daniela and Small Town Heroes, and... So you organized a little showcase, a little acoustic yeah. showcase in the office. Yeah. So you were like, you were pushing it. Yeah. Were, I was like, if they're not. Did anybody come, know that you were bringing a band into the office for the ten for the ten a.m. No, staff meeting? I kind of just told. I was just like, everyone come in, you know, today, and um, I mean, everyone did. I mean, at that moment, really loved them, but it did still take time for sure, um, for a number of reasons. But and I just kept staying on everyone, making sure. You know, just knowing the updates and stayed in touch with Andy and stuff. Now, like Andy, that. were you actively pursuing other label options at the same time? We were and we weren't. Um, there were the same labels that turned us down for Lookout Mama. Uh, we were still talking to because they were all, you know, interested in some capacity. But, but really, I mean, it really was Kirby. Like that's it. You know, like well, I mean, they were like the best label we thought, you know, fit wise and. We knew that they actually spend money on, on promoting the records instead of just like releasing the album and seeing what sticks, you know. And that was really important to me, you know, that, you know, 
because I have I have some friends who who uh, are, are publicists and they they sort of give me the lowdown on certain labels, which ones are cheap, which ones aren't, and they're all heard nothing but good things about ATO, but but when Kirby became interested, it was it was sort of like a Josh thing where it was like, well, this person's interested and it's going to take months for them to really you know give us a deal or an offer or whatever, um, but when we kind of thought we were going to get there. Maybe it was confidence or, or arrogance or, or what have you. But, you know, her... Fate. Her, well, I mean, you know, her, her, pa her passion was very strong, and we knew the material was strong, so we just sort of had faith in the process, saying, well, that's, that's the label we want, you know. Well, Kirby, can you kind of peel back the curtain a little bit on what some of the decision-making process is at the label? So you're there. You're passionate. You're like, come on, guys, this is awesome. Don't you get it? What What... <laughs> What took so long? What is the resistance that you encountered that prevented a deal from happening like immediately? I mean, we are such a small label and I think we usually have one to two really priority developing artists, new artists per year. I mean, it is such a huge investment, time. And it was just, you know, is this gonna be the one band we go with? And I think a big hesitation was, I mean, we've, become more of, you know, people think we're, you know, an Americana, mostly Americana or folk, and we do try to keep up with being a more eclectic label. So I think that was one hesitation, even though, <laughs> of course, I think they're the best of their genre. But um, also, sales history, I mean, that's just, you know, they didn't have much of a sales history. And that's, they've had records out, it's not their first album. So I think that was a huge and mostly, I don't think you all reported sales, no, so didn't. there was... <laughs> no, um, we didn't doing that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, sound so scan was... zero. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, had, we sold stuff, but we did, we did really well on, on iTunes and, um, you know, digital through TuneCore. But, you know, with just pressing up CDs and selling them and our, our vinyl, we didn't report those to sound scan. We were just didn't... So, uh, Kirby, from, from the label standpoint, you know that you're going to... Everybody is going to be focused on one act in the, that's going to be the developing act in the, in this next year, maybe two at the most. And I guess a previous example would have been Alabama Shakes, were they uh, a band that you like really focused on as a priority? And poof, yeah. look what happened. Yeah. So so obviously that's a big investment on your part. Um, how did you end up making the decision that okay, this is going to be the one we're gonna we're gonna go all in, and this next year we're gonna get this band to Conan O'Brien and, and, you know, everywhere else? I think just these steps, you know, like Newport and um, our general manager, John Salter, he had seen them, I think once he, when we were talking about this before, it does sound kind of cliche, but he had seen them do a really amazing showcase, I think the Pace Showcase or something at South By, and, you know, and it was South just South by really, Southwest in Austin. Yeah. yeah. So, a, so a gig fixed, at South by Southwest yeah. actually led to a record deal. Oh my God. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was the final catalyst, I guess. Um, now, but Andy, you guys were already making this record. Yes. Before you had the deal in place with ATO. So this is a, a, a record that you were financing yourselves. Yes. We were, we were lucky enough to have uh, been able to be selling reasonably well um, digitally every month. Um, and so we just took that money and reinvested it in the band, and and there you go. So the so band made a decision to to instead of paying themselves from the money that was coming in from these sales, they d they were going to reinvest in the the company, as it were. In the infrastructure, sure, whatever. And yeah. and go out and make a record. Correct. So without getting into too many details about the terms of your deal, I mean, did you basically license the record to ATO, or did they buy it from you, or how did that go down? Uh, it's, it's a licensed deal for a term of years. Okay, yeah. great. So you guys own your own masters? Uh, yeah, after the, yes. Okay, so they have an exclusive license on the masters, and then Correct. after a period of time they have, they have it worldwide. All right, so, yeah. fantastic. So just, I mean, Kirby, with a, with a band, a of an indie folk pop band from New Orleans coming out playing Americana music, which is, I don't know if that's anybody's idea of what's gonna displace Lord on the radio. From your standpoint, when you guys are making projections and thinking about what the potential is and whether it's worth the investment, I mean, what is a, 
like a, a benchmark number of how many units you think need to sell before you'll say this is a success or this is a break even or this is a failure? I mean, do they have to sell 50,000 copies? Do they have to sell 20,000 copies, 100,000? What, what is, you know, where, where, where is the, the gauge on, on what is good? I mean, it's case by case for sure, but I mean, in this instance, I mean, we're almost reaching our goal. You know, we're at 20, 30,000. Um, at, at, so far? No, to oh. reach, I mean, just to break even. Okay, yeah. so 20, 30,000 units to break even. And, and then, then if it goes on to sell 50 or 75 or 80, then we're, yeah. we're looking real good. And, and also another thing is, is that one of the good things about these guys uh, are, you know, they've been talking the whole time about this will set us up for the next record, you know? So, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get a, a band out there and, and, and people know who they are, much less, you know, have heard their name. So this, this first record, um, is, a, is a first step, and it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, a means to an end by, by, any, by any means. Um, but that's something that's been in the discussions as well, is like, oh, this is, this is, we've done really well for this, and we will learn certain lessons, and then the next record is gonna be another thing. So it's, it's, the goals are, you know, there's, 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 there's short-term goals, there's medium, there's long-term, there's all kinds of goals without okay. like sticking numbers and hanging, you know, quantifiable things on them. Right, so do you view, all of you, I mean, do you still view this as an artist in development situation or is this an artist that has already arrived? Where are we? It's definitely artist in development. I mean, most people don't know who they are for sure. Right. I think um, the press campaign with this was such a huge achievement and I mean, it was a dream campaign for sure. But radio is, I mean, that's a huge missing piece. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this is just building the foundation at non-com in college and- um, Non-commercial radio yeah. is what you mean. And then I think with the next album, it'll be commercial radio. But so what's that's, the, yeah. What's the time frame for the next record? We don't know. Yeah. We, we will see what happens. I mean, we have a, uh, the record came out in February. We have the whole summer to tour, play festivals, get people to know what's going on. Radio might pick up, might not, I don't know. You know, but it, it all depends on how many songs she has, how she feels. Yeah, Josh? I think it, it speaks to the kind of artists that we're talking about. I, I think Hooray for the Riff Raff and Alinda is uh, an artist that will continually, you know, gather moss as it rolls along. You know, I don't, I, I don't see that there really being an end or, there's cycles, but I don't think there are end to cycles. It's just how can we keep moving forward and, and, and building on what's there? And people will always go back to this record, whether or not there is another one, whatever the case is, and you'll still see sales kind of at its, at its level. You know, it'll, it'll maintain. Now, Josh, when you started working with the band as, as their agent, they had already played Newport Folk Festival in 2013, right? So, um, and that event, generated a, an enormous amount of publicity and interest, broadcast live on national public radio, and all of a sudden the media starts picking up, and wow, who was this band that played at Newport? Well, and I think what's are... funny about that is, I'm sorry to interrupt, is that yeah, all ahead. our shows, I think you meet, like the week following, all of a sudden we're just like completely sold out. Yeah, that I mean, was we really saw crazy. like an immediate just, you know, tick on the radar just went up huge. So, can you talk about that, that transition? I mean, how much harder or easier did your job get at that point? Is it suddenly like, oh, yeah, of course, we want hooray for the riffraff, and, you know, routing tours becomes no problem, or are you still encountering lots of resistance out there? Um, I, you know, I, I, I think it really depends. I think there's a, a, a huge amount of awareness on the band in certain circles, and then I think in certain circles, because we want to try and you know, we want to we want to create this this help create this band so it can it can play the Coachellas it can play the other festivals where they may not seem like to shoe in right away you know um, there will be always be conversations of convincing on why this is a, a good thing for certain things to do but at the end of the day I mean for the last 18 months or more the awareness factor has just gone through the roof I mean you know you know when. When people start calling you a lot more than you're making the phone calls, is that's when you know it's starting to move in the right direction. And I, I think that it, it all, like one hand washes the other, you know, with, um, with Josh 
booking a really great tour that we did back in September of 2013 helped us, you know, get more awareness. And then when ATO came aboard, they hired the publicist who got this, I mean, insane uh, media campaign that was just amazing, which helps, you know, which helps him pitch the band because NPR says all these wonderful, loving things and all these great reviews, and then that helps us tour more, which helps us sell more records, and there you go. Shorefire, as a publicist, has, have been yeah, incredible. Have they've, them... they've done an amazing job. Yeah. And, and uh, publicists, I think, it, 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 that's also a very difficult side of the business, too, because you never know. I mean, for everybody involved, I don't, you, know, it's, you never really know what you're going to get out of it. You don't know how it's going to react. And, and a hat tip, again, to ATO for spending the money for Shorefire, who are not cheap. And um, we definitely got our money's worth, that's for sure. <laughs> but no, it's really important. It's really important to get, you know, if to, to, the team, to spend the, the money, you know, so. Every facet of this team has delivered, I feel like. Definitely. Top to bottom, or whichever, however way it lines up. And that's been a, that's a huge contributing factor. Because we are dealing with, again, an artist that's amazing. But everybody who's been brought on board has done what they were supposed to do. And, and also, we're... We're not really geniuses up here. Um, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Hey, wait a minute. We've got... <laughs> Speak no, for yourself, no, Heiser. No, but seriously, but seriously, but seriously. I think we would all agree that we're working with a genius here, and, and, and that's, that's not an, understa or an overstatement. You know, like, we're all, hard, we're all passionate and hard workers and competent people, but if we didn't have Alinda writing these beautiful songs and, and working her ass off, you know, they're, they're, we're, we're not up here if we if we didn't have s someone amazing. And and let's so, certainly acknowledge that Alinda is one of those rare artists who has not only the talent and the charisma and the ability to write these great songs and this extraordinary singing voice, uh, and just her look, her presence, her vibe. But also, she's got that incredible determination and work ethic. I mean, she is really willing to be up all night, get up early in the morning, do all of the things that it takes. Not necessarily wanting to talk all the business affairs stuff right. at a panel right. like right. this, but she'll talk about songwriting all day yeah, long. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the I like, I use the Ahmet Erdogan um, quote when he's the guy who started Atlantic Records and signed everybody from Ray Charles to Aretha Franklin and, I don't know, Led Zeppelin and everybody. And he says, you know, how do you make it in the music business? You walk from this end of the room to that end of the room. And if you bump into a genius, you hang on to them. And if you don't bump into a genius, you keep walking. And that's important, too, to keep walking if you, you, know, you don't want to waste your time with somebody that's not a genius. And that's, that's how I feel about it. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm not being false modest, you know, but, but really, I mean, I, I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for her. So. Right. The level of hard work can't be undersold either, though. I mean, this, you know, everyone involved, from the artists to everybody on this team here, this isn't a nine to five job, you know, we're not punching in and punching out, we all live, breathe it and eat it, you know, and sleep it, so. And you all know that the more recognition, the more success, doesn't mean that you get to rest on your laurels, it just means no. you have more opportunities to work harder. <laughs> more stuff. More, more opportunities, right. more work, more opportunities, more work. I mean, uh, but. The true test of a driven person, you know, I guess. Right, um, but everybody feels like it's going in the right direction, obviously. Yeah. And so, so you talked about different levels of goals, short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals. Can you give us an idea of what, what some of those are? Uh, I mean, not necessarily like in terms of projection of sales figures or, I mean, well, 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 well there's one other thing that, that uh, I forgot to ask about. What about um, publishing? Sometimes in the development of an artist's career, sometimes it's a, a performance rights organization that might step up and say, here, let me help with demo money, or, uh, or let me t talk to this person, uh, or sometimes a publishing company will come along first. Um, w was, was that part of this picture? Um, we currently don't have a publishing company, okay. um, but we're about to enter into a, a deal. So, okay, yeah. great, so so that, but that wasn't part of the process that got to this level. Oh, that kind of came, came last. Okay. Um, well, maybe there are other things that are, could come last after that. But um, you know what I mean, uh, that, that wasn't a, that's not been a part of the story just yet. Not right. yet. Okay. Do we have any questions? Any of y'all here have any questions? Feel free to use the microphones if you do. Uh-oh. <laughs> this has been very informative. I just want to say, Andy, um, that uh, I appreciate your hard work 
Um, I'm actually one of the publishers that has been talking to the band and hopefully the one. Um, I saw Linda in, uh, I think, 2008 at House of Blues. I think it was a little bit later than was that. Was it 09, yeah. opening for Ani? Yeah. And I immediately got the, uh, the star power. Um, what, what I was <clears throat> kind of waiting for as a publisher is the song. So I just want to echo what's been said here. When, I, when, when we heard this record, um, we were convinced as publishers that not only will this succeed as an artist, but w she will thrive in any aspect of songwriting that she wants to thrive in. And that includes if she wants to work in Nashville. That's, that's sort of what's key to a publisher is having that flexibility. So I'm just throwing that in, and, uh, and I'm excited about this band. Well, she's certainly got the outfits to work in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> that we know. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Tyrone. Josh, nice to meet you. And um, I had a question. Aloha. It's, aloha. Uh, a bit of a, it's, uh, a bit of a dirty word for some artists, but uh, the importance of a hit, and it's just, it's so, it, it seems to be, you know, you have to have that amazing team in place. You guys are really passionate, and all, you know, talk about all the cogs that are working really hard, uh, including the band. But that hit seems to be the most, still the most pervasive thing that that nobody. I haven't heard the word hit in a, in a, you know, anywhere in years. Yet it's still, you know, Alabama Shakes had had a huge hit. Uh, look at Kings of Leon. They were at a high level, but stuck at that level in the States for years and years. And then they had an album with a major commercial hit. Uh, do you talk to artists about that? I know it's something that's the problem is you don't know where's that hit come from. But, but you, the, still, do you ever talk? Well, you know, at some point, we're hoping one, this, this something hits like really big and that's going to jump us to the next level. Could you talk some about that? No, they don't want to hit. Yeah. <laughs> no, it definitely is important to have a hit for sure with radio like I said with this album being more of a developmental with the radio campaign and I mean we have had conversations with Alinda about maybe the next record and but I mean we really don't <laughs> with the artistic you know um yeah, they've been Space, really hands yeah. off. There's been no, we need a hit, you know, like the, the typical, like you got the guy with yeah. the cigar. And well, so like, when you asked Alinda about having Danger Mouse do a dance remix, right, I mean, yeah, how did that go yeah. over? Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. No, but it's just like, you know, we, we delivered a record for this record and it wasn't like they, they didn't say, well, you know, there's a little bit too many uh, slow songs here that are kind of depressing. You know, they're just like, oh, this record's great. Let's put it out. Awesome. You know, and... We, d we delivered the artwork, which we're really proud of, and, and they didn't, you know, they, they loved it, and it's, it's been, to this, I mean, to this point, you know, I, we haven't been, uh, we haven't been shaken down for a pop, a pop hit. I mean, that, this, the Conan song was a pop song, you know, it's, she writes in all different, different ways, you know. So. It seems that's, impo it seems that's important that uh, the artist has that patience and recognizes that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that not only the labels have the patience, but sometimes an artist is eager and well, I have all these people behind me. Why isn't why isn't this jumping to the you know two levels up? Um, but so it's it's great to hear the whole, whole team has that patience. One other question I can throw out is uh, the album cycle. There's some artists. Uh, there's an artist here that I love in New Orleans, uh, maybe more than any other artist, and uh, he has a tendency to put out albums every jazz fest, and it seems to get diluted. Uh, it doesn't seem to get the press behind all those albums, and and then every time I come, you know, his whole set is almost all new songs that I've never heard before, um, which is which is a challenge for me. It's a challenge for everybody. It's that. Is it just go to your general discussion about, do you worry about artists that are putting out albums every year? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for, with this, in this case, I mean, it just takes so long to develop and you at least need two years, I would think, um, in between album cycles to fully work the album and get as much as you can out of it. So yeah, that's definitely a concern. And they're so busy on the road, they don't really have time to get in the studio. So we're not really thinking about the next record. I mean, we're thinking, but we're not really thinking. Uh, thank you. Thank now, you. Tomorrow, you may know that we have a panel on how artists are breaking into the public consciousness by getting a song licensed into a TV commercial, specifically TV commercials as opposed to movies or TV shows or, or video games or anything like that. Um, I imagine that when publishing becomes part of the picture, maybe the label is actively pushing some of, some of those type of placements. Is, have you had any luck on the placement side at all? Not yet, and we just locked in our licensing sync team. So that's another you know, step that we're just starting to get going. But it, so. 
that would be very interesting yeah. to turn on the TV and see a Volkswagen commercial with Hooray for the Riff Raff. Sure, and that's, that's something that would be, um, uh, that's going to be a conversation. You well, know. is that the kind of thing that, a, a Linda, is a Linda the kind of artist that would say, no way, man, I'm, I'm not doing that? Uh, you know, sure. Uh, or maybe not, you know, it all depends. You know, it's certainly, it's something that we've discussed internally a little bit about, you know, what our tolerance for is, that thing, and, and we, we, we don't have an answer. As opposed to, to say, honest. maybe getting a placement, you know, like the closing credits in a Coen Brothers movie well, or something. There's a, there's a giant like. difference between, you know, a T-Mobile commercial and a Coen Brothers movie, sure. Right, so it's just it's gonna be about how it feels when the opportunity comes up. I, you know, I, I, don't, I can't speak for her. She, okay. she makes those decisions, not me. Okay, fair enough. Yes. Uh, well, Scott, that was exactly my question. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so, so I already got See, the I could, I could feel you. I could feel yeah. you. I, could I already got the answer. Uh, my name's Elton Foster, but I was going to ask you about licensing and, and what it, at what step um, that falls into what you're doing and whether or not it's a little premature for that. You're waiting for more exposure, uh, waiting for more unit sales, and then uh, wait for the licensing to come along, or are you actively pushing it? I think you already answered a, a good bit of it, but... Thanks. Yeah, it's Sorry. A piece. You know we're working on, so. I know what's wrong. Like I think it's prime for some great placement, though. I think but that's all right, you know? Yeah. We could <laughs> work a lot of different ways. Hi. Hi, I'm Rachel Kane <laughs> from Trax Records. And Kirby, I'm really interested in talking to you a little bit because I'm from Chicago. I know old 97. Love the band. Are you the president of the label? Are you kind of the bottom line? No, um, I'm a product manager, so there's, we're pretty small, there's only five of us, and so our general manager, three product managers, and then our art director. So, um, yeah, we're pretty small, and, but we all collaborate on, you know, bringing in new artists, and, but I work specifically on Hooray for the Riff Raff, Old Crow, Alabama Shakes, um, Ockerville River, Jay Roddy, those are my big ones right now. Very impressive. I was mentored by Sylvia Robinson of Sugar Hill, and there aren't too many women that are really involved with labels, or at least I find that. So that's why I wanted to ask you about Kirby's that. being modest. She's got the juice. She's got the, I believe it. That's why I'm questioning her about all this and being a woman, you know, in business myself. And then we do a lot of licensing for tracks records. We've been doing that forever and ever. But of course, we're house music. You know, Frankie Knuckles is one of the people from the label that we have. And, and you uh, have a New Orleans act as well. Yes, we do. That's yes. Right. Mad Wicked, which is just awesome, awesome. Braft Punk. And uh, I do my own music. I have my own publishing catalog of about 100 tunes that I've written. And Rolling Stone just declared one of my t songs the top 20 house records of all time. So that was pretty cool. But uh, what I really want to ask you, besides my bragging and then women power, is uh, a little bit about the social media network. Do you have a social media network team? Um. We, we have a nice fan base on, uh, on Facebook. We came to Twitter a little bit late in the game. Um, Kirby and, uh, and ATO were helpful in sort of cleaning up the, the look of, of our, our social media because you know, we don't really have graphic designers for those types of things. Um, you know, we, we try not to post too much, but just enough. You know, I, I don't, we don't have a team for that. It's just all of us sort of talk about that sometimes. It, it comes up, obviously. Is Alinda personally active on Facebook or Twitter? Yes. So, yeah. I so mean, I, I post a lot for just show stuff. You know, like, hey, we're playing this thing, and you should come. And then she posts more personal things. Does she post as Hooray for the Riff Raff or as Alinda? Uh, well, on the Hooray for the Riff Raff thing. Sometimes okay. she signs at Alinda if it's like a personal note. Or right. I saw, I saw that she did one talking about the, being on Conan Correct. and how can, can you believe it? I watched Conan yeah. as a kid on TV and now here we are getting ready to play on his show. And it was signed Alinda, yeah. but it was on the, the Hooray for the Riff Raff account. So, right. But, but to, when people are interacting on, on social media, do you think they get the sense that they're actually talking to her and that she's developing an actual relationship with with? People? Yeah, I mean, the general rule between between us is that if it's like a personal thing, then it's her, and if it's just a news update, it's it's me. And and mm -hmm. on the Twitter, it's 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 ninety nine percent her. Um, yeah. Well, I do think she is an incredible, incredible artist. 
Uh, but the reason I asked about the social media networking is that's what a lot of people say Trax needs more of. So that's why I was curious with asking you. Because we have, you know, the thousands of fans, but there's a lot of people that have millions of fans. And I was just wondering if you were building towards that. But you've answered my question, so thank you very much. All right, and we have time for one more question, so go ahead. Hi, I'm Donna Thomas, and my question is something that most people don't like to talk about, which is budget. How much do you allocate to a developing artist, and where is most of that money spent? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't, do you want to talk about budgets? I mean, generally speaking, a lot of our budget goes towards publicity. Um, I mean, we have video, you know, budget, marketing, advertising, um, radio. I mean, the radio uh, campaign is a huge part of the budget. Um, but yeah, I would say press and radio are the two biggest chunks. So, so for a new artists, just a round figure. I mean, for uh, a developing yeah, I mean, artist, just in... Just, just a, some idea. Two hundred dollars? No, no, no. Just kidding. Two, two fifty. <laughs> two fifty. Two fifty. No, I mean, I think how much I, you got on you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's. And, it's, and, yeah, and I mean, you guys are a small company, so it's not like you, you always say small. It's like five people, right? You said five people in your, mm -hmm. in your organization. Yeah. Well. But we hire out. Like we have indies for radio and for okay. press, and then we actually share a commercial radio team with Red Light Management, and so, okay. yeah. But that's fine. All right, great. Well, so let's wrap up. Um, it, it sounds like for the lessons to be learned from, from this particular example is, well, always starting with talent, just undeniable sheer talent that everybody recognizes the minute they see it. Timing, awesome timing, and the, the timing of, you know, you encountered Alinda before any of us, certainly. Uh, and the, the timing of how the, the different team members join the team. And then after that, it seems like it's just passion. So everybody I mean, is, is a true believer, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the reason why I really like these two people up here, is because they, they share the passion and they're, they're good people and I have to talk to them all the time. So, um, you know, they're, no, they're, they're really great people. So, um, and they, they love the band and there you go. Yeah. yeah, you can really feel a difference with different teams, you know, with passion and... Cetera. I enjoy their company, yeah, <laughs> it helps. <laughs> it does, you know, like... and you're not even in the van. Exactly. And, <laughs> exactly. Imagine if you were. I'm not in the van, that's for sure. All right, <laughs> All right. well, how about a round of applause for this great panel, the manager, Andrew Beiser, ATO Records, Kirby Lee, and Josh Brinkman from Monterey International. Thank you guys for giving your morning to come speak at Sync Up. <laughs>